117. Here we go. Hi, I'm Chris Wilson from Grinding Gear Games. Thanks for joining us today as we reveal Path of Exile's next expansion, Sentinel, which launches on PC and Mac on May 13th, and on Xbox and PlayStation on May 18th. Twitch drops are enabled for today's live stream, so make sure you follow the instructions below to link your account and earn your Rapture Wings. In February, we launched Siege of the Atlas, an expansion that drastically changed Path of Exile's mapping endgame. It removed Atlas regions and watchstones and introduced the gigantic Atlas-wide passive tree and four new pinnacle bosses to challenge. One other very important aspect of the new endgame is its modularity. We designed it in a way where it's easy to expand with more content, and that's exactly what we're going to do. Alongside the Sentinel Challenge League, this expansion doubles down on the best parts of Siege of the Atlas to give you ultimate control over your endgame experience. What's up, X? What's up, Dragonfly? Here's what you can expect from today's live stream. We'll start with a trailer for the Sentinel expansion, and then we'll go through its content and features in detail, starting with how the new Sentinel Challenge League lets you control your level of risk and reward. Ooh. We'll then move on to the improvements we have made to Path of Exile's endgame. We'll discuss modifications to the Atlas-wide passive tree, the introduction of 20 Atlas Keystone passives, new variations on pinnacle boss fights, and powerful unique items designed by the winners of our Siege of the Atlas boss kill event. Following that, we'll discuss the type of balance changes we're making, or more interestingly, not making in this expansion. Okay. We'll then cover what we're doing with magic and rare monster modifiers, various quality of life improvements, and the full release of controller support for PC players. After showing you our latest support, support. we'll head into a live Q&A with community streamer Ziggy D, where we'll answer Come your on, questions. Wilson. Once that finishes, we'll post the expansion's full patch notes. Mm. There's a lot to cover, so let's roll the trailer for Sentinel. Here we go. In the wake of your power, something has arisen. Dark sentinels, hungry for a share. But these cruel constructs can be harnessed. Take them, bind them to your will. Test and tinker, combine and reconfigure. Come on. And together, you will find your fortune. Some sentinels are powerful. Others are dangerous. But in a world with shifting stars, monstrous new threats, and valuable treasures, you will need them. The Sentinels await your command. The Sentinels have their own passive tree? Is that what I saw? I'm sure you have a lot of questions, so let's get started with a full explanation of the upcoming Sentinel Challenge League. Sentinels are ancient constructs that have been unearthed across Rayclast. In this league, you will collect these Sentinels and attempt to harness their great power. But this symbiosis is not without risks. Once deployed, a sentinel follows you, watching and waiting for you to enter combat. As you encounter enemies, the sentinel will fire a beam that doesn't damage the enemy, but rather empowers them. This not only amplifies the difficulty of the foe, but also the rewards that it yields. Interesting. There are three classes of sentinels that you will find as you kill monsters in this league. Stalker sentinels will follow you for around 30 seconds, empowering dozens of monsters before they dissipate. This is like a build your own breach or delirium effect, because you control what monsters you're fighting when you deploy the Sentinel, and through various means that we'll describe shortly, you're also in control of how much the monsters are empowered. Lots in of contrast to Stalker control. Sentinels, Pandemonium Sentinels are designed for mass area of effect and typically only fire one shot, but this shot really counts, chaining between monsters to affect an entire screen full of foes at once. This class of Sentinel can be very dangerous because it empowers so many enemies at one time. 
Hello. The final class, Apex Sentinels, can only empower rare or unique enemies. They fire fewer shots, but have a much larger impact on difficulty and reward. You start with a single slot to equip a Stalker Sentinel, but as you play through the league, you can eventually unlock two more Sentinel slots so that you can have one Sentinel of each class equipped at a time. Each class of Sentinel can be deployed only once per area that you play. You'll quickly develop various strategies for when each class of Sentinel is best used. For example, saving your Pandemonium Sentinel for when you're surrounded by monsters, or using your Apex Sentinel on the map boss or league content that spawns several rare monsters. With a full loadout of Sentinels equipped, in every map you'll get to empower bosses of your choice, choose up an entire screen at once with a button press, and choose the part of the map for its best to empower a series of dozens of monsters. Sentinels cannot be damaged by monsters in combat, but do gradually deplete their internal power supply each time you use them. They can be found as you play and are incompatible with traditional ray and crafting techniques. However, New Sentinels with different properties can be assembled from the depleted husks of others that you have used until their internal power supplies ran out. We'll explain that crafting process in more detail later on. So you'll see at the you bottom it has its own UI. Mods on them. These mods can augment the base properties of a Sentinel, extending its duration, making it empower monsters faster, increasing the number it can empower, or even the degree to which the monsters are empowered, affecting both their difficulty and rewards. Some mods will add specific drops, such as currency items, essences, or unique items, to monsters empowered by the Sentinel, but at the cost of increasing how difficult the monster is to defeat. You can also occasionally find rare Sentinels that have more than two mods on them. These are generally quite a lot more powerful than normal or magic Sentinels if you find the right combination of mods. Dragon the Sentinels Blade, that's you how find a lot as you explore class will become more powerful. Some particularly powerful yeah, ones with special properties plans. can only come from the process of assembling new Sentinels from depleted ones. While the Sentinels you find generally get better and better as you play through the League, you can also upgrade the behavior and properties of Sentinels through your Sentinel Controller. The Sentinel Controller is like a runic circuit board. It's what powers your Sentinels and allows you to customize them. There are specific nodes for each of the three types of Sentinel, so you can customize the properties and behavior of all of them, or potentially focus on your favorite base types. Man, As you play through the league so and kill more and more enemies affected by your Sentinels, your controller will gain power. You start with four units, which is enough to power your first Sentinel slot and your first Runic node. By the end game, you are able to work up to 30 power units, which is enough for almost half of the controller to be powered at once. So, how do you choose which runic nodes to power? Good question. You do this by connecting them together with filaments. Power flows from the top of the circuit through the filaments until it is all in use by the nodes you have connected. You can set up filaments in advance and they'll automatically be used as more power becomes available. Moving filaments around has no cost. It's basically like a planning tool that gradually gets activated as you gain more power throughout the league. Filaments! So you're not locked into a specific plan and you can respec for free at any time. Some powerful runic nodes require two filaments and hence allocate more of your power when activated. Mm. Additional sentinel slots for other types like pandemonium and apex sentinels, for example, require three filaments and hence three power units each. While it's almost always best to have all three slots powered so you can use all three sentinels per area, there are niche strategies where you want to unpower specific sentinel slots in order to have more power for additional runic nodes, also that you can fully specialize in just one or two sentinel types. Just to reiterate, you can change your allocation as much as you like, so feel free to experiment. It looks like the device at This my powerful work. runic node allows pandemonium sentinels to be used an additional time each area. While this is basically pure upside, you should definitely plan around the fact that you'll be running their charge down pretty quickly if you use this node. This runic node prevents your stalker sentinels from empowering normal rarity enemies. While this seems very powerful at first, because you'll just be empowering magic, rare, or unique enemies that benefit greatly from the boost of item drops, you should be aware that unless you have a large source of special enemies, you'll be fighting against the flight duration of your Sentinels and will probably want to build around increasing their duration. Mm. While the Sentinel controller lets you specialize how the different classes of Sentinels behave, it's generally not necessary to have to modify it for each new Sentinel that you equip. The runic nodes you have chosen represent your overall strategy for each class of Sentinel and rarely need to be tweaked if you swap one Sentinel for another. 
As you use Sentinels in combat across a number of maps, they eventually run out of charge and will become depleted. But they don't need to be thrown away when this occurs. You can find power cores that let you assemble a new Sentinel with a full charge. This Our process cores. disassembles two existing Sentinels and creates a hybrid of the two, with their properties combined together. Right-clicking a power core opens up an assembly screen. If you insert two Sentinels and click the Assemble button, a new, fully charged one will be created. This process is a complex and unpredictable one that can either inherit properties from the input Sentinels or potentially produce new ones that weren't based on either of them. Hmm. For example, the base type of the Sentinel could either be the left input Sentinel, the right input Sentinel, or an entirely new one that can't spawn naturally and can only Orangey. come from this process. The same applies to its modifiers. You generally get a mix of modifiers from the two input Sentinels, but sometimes they have their tiers upgraded or entirely new mods added occasionally including ones that are exclusive to the assembly process. The end result is that you're usually getting sentinels that are similar in function to the depleted ones you have combined, but occasionally mutate in new ways, producing results that unlock more power and possibilities. The best sentinels in the game will come from lucky combinations of depleted sentinels that have just the right mods. It's also possible to assemble two sentinels directly into one of the many valuable unique sentinels. Ooh, unique sentinels. Specialized power cores exist, which influence the assembly process to greatly increase the chances of various interesting outcomes occurring. They don't guarantee anything, but are absolutely worth considering if you're trying to hit unlikely assembly results. You may want to accumulate a small collection of depleted Sentinels so that you have options to assemble together. That's where the Sentinel Locker comes in. It's a free object that you can place in your hideout that allows you to store stacks of each of the Sentinel currency items, as well as a tab full of each of the three categories of Sentinel. You can also store Sentinels in regular stash tabs, and they can be freely traded with other players. The Sentinel Locker's affinity for Sentinels will also work with regular stash tabs while this league is active. As I hinted at before, you can find or create unique Sentinels. These have powerful static properties, but because they cannot be combined with other Sentinels, there's no way to recharge them once they become depleted. They are essentially limited use items with powerful effects. Let's look at a few examples. First Hex. off, we have yes. the Basilisk. Lots and this is lots a pandemonium sentinel that mechanic. augments its wide area of effect blast with a petrification effect. Any monsters caught in the blast are turned to stone. Rather than being primarily useful for raising the risk and reward of combat like other sentinels, this one is incredibly useful as an emergency button in combat. By activating the Basilisk, you can freeze most of the monsters around you in place, letting you take control of dangerous situations. This unique sentinel, the Hollow-Eyed Skull, is basically a headhunter in sentinel form. There are also a set of unique sentinels that are designed to empower specific named Atlas map bosses. If you activate one of these sentinels while fighting that boss, it empowers the boss into an extremely dangerous version that is very, very rewarding if you can defeat it. The highly empowered boss fight is further scaled by whatever mods are on the map that contain it, so you'll want to be pretty careful with what mods you choose to use. So you have your normal map on the mods, other hand, it's rewards are scaled by reward bonuses on that map. So if you're able to defeat one of these boss. bosses in a juiced map, you will certainly be greatly rewarded. Yikes. These highly empowered map bosses are the best source of recombinators, a new type of endgame currency item that can be found in the Sentinel League. Recombinators allow you to apply the Sentinel assembly process to two pieces of equipment of the same item class, combining them together in unpredictable ways. This process can also rarely imbue your items with exclusive modifiers that don't normally spawn on that type of item. While the recombination process involves significant risks, you could combine the best parts of two rare items together, maybe getting a lucky exclusive mod spawn, and end up with one of the best weapons, armor pieces, or jewelry in Path of Exile. Jeez. Sentinels can be deployed while engaging in other League content, so you can juice the risk and reward to quite crazy levels. For example, you could enter a Mirror of Delirium, trigger a Breach, and deploy your Sentinel at the same time, causing the monsters to have three significant modifiers to both their difficulty and rewards. There are only a few specific areas that Sentinels can't be deployed in, mostly for technical reasons, and those are Unique Maps, Pinnacle Atlas Bosses, and the Simulacrum. So that's Sentinel in a nutshell. 
It's a combat league that gives you heaps of control over the exact risk and reward you encounter, it stacks with other combat-enhancing league mechanics, juices your endgame bosses beyond any kind of reasonable difficulty, lets you play with temporary headhunters, and might even let a few players assemble some pretty insane rare items if they're lucky. We're very much looking forward to seeing your stories after you've had a chance to play with it next week. X says I'd like 70, or it'd be like 70% in addition to the Sentinel with Challenge League, this expansion you further get the improves right on the new tabs. endgame introduced since Siege of the Atlas, its Atlas-wide passive tree and pinnacle boss fights. Pay for those the new endgame was designed to give you ultimate control over what kind of content you want to play and how difficult and rewarding you want it to be. With the Sentinel expansion, we are doubling down on what makes this new endgame the best one that Path of Exile has ever had. This expansion introduces 20 powerful keystone passives to the Atlas tree. 20. As you know from the regular passive skill tree, keystone passives are usually dramatic and build-changing, with both upsides and potential downsides. Each keystone can completely change the way you play Path of Exile's endgame, and we have designed keystone passives for many different playstyles and situations. The second big change is that we have introduced these clusters of passives that grant you even more control over what endgame content you encounter. As you know, you can encounter many different types of past league content randomly within maps. These new passives allow you to prevent content you don't enjoy from appearing randomly or simultaneously causing other content to spawn at a higher rate. Aside from the obvious convenience of only encountering the past league mechanics that you choose, the system is great for target farming specific content that you have juiced on your Atlas tree. Thirdly, we have created incredibly difficult and rewarding uber versions of seven pinnacle boss fights which can be accessed via six new keystone passives. These fights are designed to challenge the absolute best path of XL players, and suffice to say, they are brutally difficult. Let's take a look at some of the new keystones and boss fights. The singular focus keystone makes it significantly more likely that your favored maps will drop. If a map Ooh. drops that is not one of your favored maps, it will be converted into a random currency item. This means that you'll exclusively see your favored maps, and outside of that, more currency. This is the realization of the I only want to play one map dream that some players have. It also helps players who are over-sustaining maps and would rather just get extra currency items. The Stream of Consciousness keystone prevents you from modifying your maps with fragments or scarabs. Are they gonna go through it means that when extra content is being rolled for your maps, ones? each of the base chances is 50% higher. This is really useful for players who don't want to have to think about juicing their maps and would instead prefer to get a constant moderate bonus instead. The following two keystones are for very advanced players who have completed their Atlas trees and want to get a very specific outcome with all of their skill points. The Wandering Path keystone increases the effect of small passives on your Atlas skill tree and disables all notable passives. Mm. The Grand Design Keystone increases the monster pack size in each of your maps by an amount proportional to the number of notable passives you have allocated. However, the trade-off is that small passives have no effect. That's not worth it. These two keystones are very good for specializing into maximizing pack size and quantity at the expense of specific league content, which is great for general magic fine builds or divination card farmers. The Twist of Fate keystone changes the behavior of corrupted rare maps in unpredictable ways. Upon entering a map, you may be sent to an alternative map of the same tier with randomized modifiers. All of the master missions, scarabs, and kirit crafts applied to the map will also be randomized. This process will not pick an outcome that was already on the map, so it always shifts it to a new property that you didn't have before. This means that you can play all of the scarabs, master missions, and maps that you enjoy, and any leftover ones can be randomized to new outcomes, which are guaranteed to not be the ones you started with. This may have some interesting economic consequences as well, with players feeding bad scarabs or maps into the Twist of Fate lottery. Man, the Wellspring of Creation and Dance of Destruction keystones one. change the ratios of monster life and damage in maps on the Atlas, so that they are more dangerous and less tanky, or vice versa. These two keystones are designed to be remedial, allowing players with an abundance of offense or defense to normalize themselves so that they can handle the content better. If you find yourself in a situation where you're waiting for a weapon cool upgrade or can't fix your resistances, then you could allocate one of these keystones to temporarily make things easier before unallocating it later when your build is complete. Six yeah. new keystones create uber versions of Path of Exile's pinnacle boss fights. Venarius, Cyrus, the Maven, the Searing Exarch, the Isha of Worlds, and the Shaper and Uber Elder, who I guess is now called the Uber Uber Elder? 
allocating one of these keystones on your Atlas passive tree ramps up the corresponding boss fight so that it is extremely difficult. Like, really hard. Harder than saying goodbye to Zana hard. Really Only allocate hard. these keystones if your character is extremely powerful and you know you can handle the challenge. In general, the encounter's rules are modified to be far more punitive and difficult. In return, though, you can earn some very enticing rewards. Each of the Uber fights has an additional high chance reward and a chance of getting a very, very rare chase reward. For example, the Uber Maven guarantees an elevated sextant if you're able to complete the encounter. Very rarely, though, you may be able to earn an awakened exceptional support gem as well, such as Empower, Enlighten, or Enhance. These keystones unlock crazy battles that will challenge our most aspiring players who are deep in Path of Exile's endgame. They add a new level of difficulty for those who want to push their builds even farther than they ever have before. The keystones we have shown you so far are designed around many different types of endgame players. Some glass cannon players struggle with defenses but have no problem with offense. Some players want to just play one map. Some players want the difficulties to be ramped up and to receive rewards commensurate with this added challenge. The keystones also let you identify a specific reward, type of content, or playstyle and know exactly how you can get the most out of it. There are a number of other new keystones that we'll reveal before release. Like the ones we have shown you today, these keystones require you to consider your endgame plan in an entirely new light. We're very interested to see what strategies you will use to try to conquer the new uber pinnacle bosses. Mm. Before we get into the new unique items, there are a few other endgame atlas changes that we should cover. We are removing Vinktar's Square and Doyani's Machinarium from the Atlas of Worlds because they are not natural map drops. You can still get and play these maps, of course, but they aren't counted for your overall Atlas completion anymore. Their Atlas passive points have been moved to rewards for defeating the Infinite Hunger and the Black Star. We have rebalanced Influence Altars and maps. They now feel a lot different than they did in the form they were introduced in Siege of the Atlas. Their downsides now feel more impactful and they have more diversity of rewards, including new rewards. The intention is to fulfill the original design goal of having an ultimatum-like choice about whether you want to accept additional challenge for additional reward. We've added better Atlas tree support for them, including two keystones that can affect them. We've also rebalanced the drop weightings of the new Pinnacle Atlas bosses, changing the relative drop weightings of their unique rewards and making them more likely to drop Eldritch currency. Currently, in Siege of the Atlas, like Elder net. and Shaper Scarabs are basically worthless mm -hmm. because their influence is worse than the free influence you can get from the Eater of Worlds and the Searing Exarch. In Sentinel, you can now apply multiple types of influence to one map, so you could have Eater of Worlds influence alongside a Shaper or Elder Scarab on a Conqueror map. Together, these three influences combined have a very large effect on that map, and this will make Elder and Shaper Scarabs significantly more desirable. The start point of encountering Shaper, Elder, or Conqueror influence and influence items has been raised to level 81 areas. We've also fixed an issue that was causing some players to skip playing most of the contents of maps. On the lower half of the Atlas passive tree, there were a lot of small skills that granted a 2% chance for the map boss to drop an additional map. This meant that it was possible to sustain maps by rushing to those bosses and ignoring every other monster in the map. We have retained the overall bonus, but have changed it so the map drops from a random monster within the map rather than the boss. We're also addressing an issue with the way that you acquire Maven boss fight invitations. Currently it's possible that you get hit with a bad streak of RNG and haven't found an invitation by the time you have enough bosses witnessed. You can now purchase these invitations from Kirak for a moderate price if you need to. At the launch of the Siege of the Atlas expansion, we hosted a competition that saw players racing to be the first to kill Path of Exile's pinnacle bosses in hardcore solo self-found mode. X, you're ready for this The main league. prize for doing so was the ability to collaborate with us on the design of a unique item that would drop from a boss in Path of Exile's endgame. Five of these uniques have been designed so far and will be featured in this expansion. The sixth one will be released once the winner has time to design it, very likely in 319. Call of the Void is a new cold-themed ring that was designed by Lighty and will drop from the Uber Elder. It causes all damage to chill and causes chilled enemies to shatter on death, as though they were frozen. On top of this, chilled enemies deal less damage back to you based on the magnitude of the chill affecting them. The only drawback is that all incoming damage also chills you, but there are many ways to mitigate this and in some cases it's beneficial to builds that utilize self-chill as part of some crazy combo. 
This ring is useful for a wide variety of different endgame builds. Echoes of Creation is a new unique helmet, also designed by Lighty, which will drop from the Shaper. It's designed for builds that use Warcrys and grants an extra use before cooldown to Warcry skills Damn, that are socketed in the these. helmet. So these are player unique. It also grants more damage to exertion attacks based tomorrow. on the number of Warcrys affecting them, but causes you to take damage when you use these attacks. The self-damage number looks really scary, but it can be mitigated by various mechanics such as armor, endurance charges, and life recovery. This powerful niche helmet is ideal for characters that try to use as many Warcrys as they can. The third Lighty unique being introduced is the Burden of Truth, a unique belt which will drop from Cyrus. Broadly speaking, this belt encourages you to have healthy energy shield and life pulse and helps you to achieve this by granting you additional energy shield based on a percentage of your maximum life value. The belt both lets some portion of chaos damage hit your energy shield, but also causes some non-chaos damage to bypass your energy shield like it was chaos damage. This is often an upside because splitting damage over both life and energy shield lets you recover both simultaneously. The Supreme Decadence Keystone that this belt grants, which is previously restricted to Timeless Jewels, causes your life flasks to apply to both your life and energy shield at a reduced rate. Overall, this belt is extremely powerful for characters who can build to have a decent energy shield pool while also using life flasks appropriately. The fourth new item that we're featuring today was created by Waggle. It's an amulet called the Eternal Struggle, which will drop from either the Infinite Hunger or the Black Star. The amulet has a pair of Eldritch mods, and the one that is dominant will be based on which of the bosses dropped it. The dominant mod also controls whether the amulet gives a Malignant Madness or Culling Strike bonus. You'll need to work out which of the two bosses to farm based on which half of the amulet you want to activate. The final unique we're showcasing today was designed by Steel Mage. It's a unique jewel that drops from the Maven. The jewel refers to a random keystone on your passive skill tree and enables you to be able to allocate passives within a radius around that keystone without them being connected to the rest of the tree. While the keystone itself cannot be allocated, this jewel allows you to jump across great distances on the passive tree in a very wow. skill point efficient way. Wow! In addition to these uniques that have come from the That's boss skill competition, cool. we have added new unique items to the Uber Pinnacle boss fights that can be accessed through some of the new oh keystone man, passives. Opens up so much. These include a different variation of Thread of Hope that can drop from Uber Cyrus, a new unique jewel which can drop from the Uber Shaper, and special Forbidden Flame and Forbidden Flesh jewels which can roll exclusive Ascendancy notable passives that are not available anywhere else in the game. You'll notice that our last endgame expansion was just three months ago and we're already extending the endgame even further. This is our plan for every expansion leading up to the release of Path of Exile 2. Rather than having a much bigger annual expansion, we plan to add as many endgame improvements into each quarterly expansion as we can, alongside its new challenge league, so that there are new challenges to overcome every time you come back to Path of Exile. One of the subtle but important aspects of our plan is to keep adding powerful new chase rewards to Path of Exile's endgame, so that there are always new reasons to complete aspirational this content. This league is huge. The boss kill competitions are great because they not only create these rewards, but also immortalize the achievements of some of Path of Exile's best players. We're going to run another boss kill competition at the launch of Sentinel. This time, players will have to defeat the uber versions of boss fights that are unlocked by the special keystone passives. We'll post full information in the lead up Dead. to release. We're gonna try something new with character balance in this expansion. We're intentionally making no changes to character power. That means no nerfs, no buffs, nothing. Every single build and build guide made for Siege of the Atlas will work exactly the same in Sentinel. You can start planning your League starter right now with full confidence about exactly how it's going to play. However, build exploration is still required in 3.18. Sentinel introduces many difficult challenges, both in the Challenge League itself and in the endgame content and you're going to have to work out a plan to create characters that are able to handle this content. But at this release, you can hit the ground running, knowing with confidence which builds are a good starting point for you. We don't intend to do this character balance freeze every release. For example, 3.19 definitely contains planned changes to character balance. Even though there are no character balance changes in 3.18 though, we have still made some changes to actual game content. For example, let's talk about the changes to monster modifiers. Magic and rare monsters Jeez. in Path of Exile get a lot of their power from their modifiers. We came up with the majority of the monster mods over a decade ago, and only substantially added to them with the introduction of the Nemesis and Bloodlines leagues in 2013 and 2014. These mods are unfortunately showing their age. Many of them are unimpactful, and it's quite hard to quickly read their descriptions in the heat of combat. 
what we need is a new set of mods that are highly impactful in combat, keyworded with one to two colored words that are easy to read at a glance and capable of producing dangerous combinations. This is exactly what we designed the Arch Nemesis mods to be, a replacement for the core monster mod pool. From 318 onwards, all previous monster mods have been replaced by Arch Nemesis mods. No other part of the Arch Nemesis League has been retained, so there's no more inventory or recipe management. Magic monsters have one Arch Nemesis mod shared across their pack, and rare monsters typically have two mods. However, it's possible to encounter rare monsters with three or even four Arch Nemesis mods on them. Combinations of multiple synergistic mods can create quite interesting situations in combat. For example, if you encounter a monster with both Storm Strider and Ice Prison, the Ice Prison may block you off so that you are more likely to run into the Lightning Mirages from the Storm Strider mod. Yeah. We've done a balanced pass over the Arch Nemesis mods before making them core. Some have certainly had their power reduced, particularly when applied to magic monsters. We have also changed how monster experience and drops are calculated, so it's now far more about the difficulty of the mods than about the proportional size of the monster. Various Nemesis and Bloodlines modifiers that were not represented in the Arch Nemesis mod pool have been added in different ways. Path of Exile's challenge system has remained Brilliant. the same for the Crazy. last 21 leagues. For Sentinel, we had a look at whether there were any easy ways we could update it based on what we have learned over the last six years. Our plan is to retain the model of 40 challenges with rewards that unlock as you progress through them, but with a goal of providing substantially more challenge to endgame players and substantially more rewards to go with it, of course. In order to achieve this, we have crunched down the easier challenges so that the first reward unlocks after only six and the second at 12. These are equivalent in difficulty to 12 and 24 challenges from the old system, respectively. This change gives us a lot more space to ramp up to some incredibly difficult challenges towards the end, which will take a lot of time and skill to complete. There are now 10 different rewards you can unlock, which comprise two complete armor sets, each with a pair of wings. But be warned, the challenges you must complete are much, much harder than any that we have ever set you before. We've been experimenting with support for game controllers on the PC version of Path of Exile. During the Arch Nemesis League, we began a beta controller. for controller support and have been making improvements based on your suggestions and feedback. We're pleased to announce that controller support on PC will officially launch alongside the Sentinel expansion. It's coming. This also means that Path of Exile is now fully playable on the Steam Deck for those of you who are lucky Ooh. enough to have one so far. Alongside finishing controller support for PC, we've also done a push on various small quality of life features in this expansion, which we'll reveal over the coming days. An example is that you can now choose whether your hideout portals can be accessed by one of four options, everyone, your friends, your guild members, or no one. We've also improved how favored maps are selected on the Atlas. Rather than having to click on the map on the Atlas for every slot, you can instead click on your existing favored maps to quickly copy it to the new slot. This makes it a lot faster to favor many instances of the same map at once. There are plenty more small QOL features crammed into Sentinel, and we'll cover these over the week leading up to release. Early in the Arch Nemesis League, we debuted Vault. Kerrick's Vault Pass. Purchasing this pass grants you access to Kerrick's Vault, where you can claim exclusive unique item skins. Oh, people hated this. Objectives in the Atlas Endgame. The Vault Battle Pass for the Arch Nemesis League is only available for a few more days and will leave the store forever when this league ends. There's no penalty for purchasing the pass late in the league after you've wrapped up your map completion. So if you are pleased with where you got to in Arch Nemesis and want to lock in your unique skins, it's not too late to buy your pass now. Thank you to everyone who unlocked Kerrick's Vault. We had a lot of fun putting it together and trying to think of fun ways that unique item skins can interact with gameplay in a visual way. The purchases directly fund development of both Path of Exile 1 and 2. A brand new Vault Pass will launch alongside the Sentinel Tencent League. Wants that like money. the previous one, there are eight Battle exclusive pass. unique item skins that can be unlocked as you complete map bonus objectives. We'll post full details on these new rewards closer to launch. To buy either the Arch Nemesis Pass now, before it leaves the store forever, or the Sentinel one when the expansion launches, go to pathofexile.com slash vault. Last. Alongside today's live stream, we're launching two new series of supporter packs, the Arcanist go. and Reaper packs. Each tier contains the pack's full face value and points, plus several exclusive microtransactions. These packs are only available during the Sentinel League and will leave the store forever in three months. Every microtransaction you are about to see is entirely cosmetic and does not affect your character's progression or power. The Arcanist pack series contains seven exclusive microtransactions. 
The Cloak of Elements indicates the power of your fire, cold, and lightning resistances on your back. When a resistance is capped, the effect is extra strong. That's pretty cool. <laughs> While wearing the Ring of the Black Star, your level up effect looks like this. In the Timekeeper's That's Hideout, cool. you can use the Chronosphere to change the time of day from dawn to noon to dusk to night. That's pretty cool. With Chevron's tome on your belt, identifying items will cause exploding books to appear nearby. The Mage Blue map device blossoms with greater intensity as you open higher tier maps. With the soul stunning weapon effect attached to your weapon, any attacks that stun will cause your enemies to have an out of body experience. So fast you can't see. Drinking from the searing Quicksilver flask causes an explosion and sets your character on fire. The Reaper Pack series also has seven exclusive cosmetic microtransactions. The Soul Harvester's cloak's power is based on the number of enemies your character has killed. That's pretty With the cool. belt of the Hive Queen equipped, flasks you use will cause blood sucking insects to appear all over your character. The Ghostlit Graveyard huh. is a hideout where you can control the color of its torches. It also comes with six exclusive hideout decorations. Medidrone will follow you around and use a healing beam on you whenever you're gaining life. Thanks, Medidrone. The Underworld Portal opens a gateway to Hell. Its effect upgrades in Part 2 and again in Maps, where it indicates what tier of map you're playing. While wearing the Ring of the Exorcist, any spells you cast will exorcise the ghosts of your enemies if you crit. While using the Grim Reaper Apparition, the Reaper will appear and cull any unique or rare enemies you slay. As I mentioned before, these packs are exclusive to the Sentinel League and will leave the store in three months. They're available right now at pathofexile.com slash purchase, and they directly fund the ongoing development of Path of Exile 2 and Path of Exile 1 expansions like Sentinel. We greatly appreciate your support. They do a pretty good job. Thanks for joining MTX. us and checking out today's reveals. We can't wait to see you in Rayclast on May 13th. We'll begin the Q&A in a few moments, so please get your questions ready in chat. Damn. That, what does everybody think? That is a pretty stellar league. It's interesting, when I first saw the Sentinels, I was like, oh, you're going to basically gives you a little minion and you could power the minion to do different things for you that's not what it is the sentinel powers the enemies so that you get better rewards but it makes it harder for you you can kind of control your level of challenge this is big uh yeah it's big it's very very large <laughs> <laughs> 